Okay. Great. And just stare into space for a little while. <laughs> well, I was doing that at the beginning, right? I'd be up here chatting with the congregation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. <clears throat> Oh, okay. <laughs> well, good morning and welcome to church on Sunday, May the 2nd. I am Pastor Daniel. It's good to have you here with us and live streaming. Uh, thanks to the small handful of helpers that are in the church with me. There's six others uh, to run the live stream service today. I'd like to take a quick point of privilege as the pastor. Uh, today is my mom's birthday. Mom and dad live up in Elliott Lake, Ontario. And uh, since we've been live streaming and doing pre-recorded services, mom and dad have been watching in on services. So just thought I would take a moment to say happy birthday, mom. Uh, my mom's 29. Now, I've tried to do the math on that. It doesn't quite work out, but my sister assured me that if I'm telling her age, that's a safe age to say publicly. So, uh, happy 29th birthday, Mom. Love you. <clears throat> a quick announcement. I want to let you know that uh, I've been approached uh, to baptize someone in the church. And so, going to extend that invitation. If baptism is something that you're interested in, then let me know and I'll, I'll invite you into those sessions. We have some classes first and then we pick a Sunday to do the baptism on. We're looking at uh, the month of June to run the classes and, uh, and have that baptism. So if that's something you're interested in or if all you want to do is sit in and, and learn more, then you're welcome to do that as well. Just communicate with me, let me know of your interest and uh, we'll get you signed up for that. Uh, some some sad news, uh, Len Bruce, he's um, uh, a fellow who's been a, a long time part of our church, commissioned minister out of our church, uh, his dad passed away this last week, so our condolences and love to Len and Denise and the rest of the family. Uh, also, Denise's mom, Bessie, is in hospital, still in hospital uh, it's been a little while now. She had fallen, broken a wrist, and she's in hospital recovering. Uh, the small blessing there is that Denise has been allowed with doctor's orders uh, to visit daily uh, her mom. So uh, that's a nice privilege in these days of, of shutdown. So um, we'll be praying for Bessie and uh, wishing them uh, all the best. This morning in our service, uh, we have a special interview. Now, you know that uh, uh, beginning um, in March, uh, the Bishop of the Free Methodist Church has called the denomination to a time of personal prayer, reflection, and praying with others. Uh, he called the exercise the rule of life, and uh, it was to help us to form good disciplines and, and habits uh, for devotional time and prayer time, inviting us to pray individually, to pray together in, in groups of three, and then also to come together uh, once a month to have a denomination-wide prayer time. Well, there's people in our church who have stepped up to that challenge, and today we're going to see an interview of three of them on screen, and so uh, you'll be interested to see that today. That's everything I need to let you know about. Uh, let's bow in a word of prayer, shall we? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your greatness, for your majesty, for your holiness. 
yet you also pay attention to us who have sinned against you. And you granted us the gift of Jesus Christ, your only Son, who went to the cross on our behalf, that if we ask forgiveness of sins, you grant that to us. What a special privilege. And we can be called the children of God. And Lord, then you sent your Holy Spirit to guide us, to equip us, to be your children and to do ministry in this world where we want your will to be done. So Lord, we ask that you would watch over us, keep us, hold us, teach us, shape us and form us into the likeness of our example, Jesus Christ. And help us to inspire one another to further grow into your kingdom. And Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. catching us at the end of one of our triad meetings and we wanted to tell you a little bit about what we have been up to. We've been taking part in the rule of life and so we've been meeting every couple weeks to go through scripture and to pray together. So we wanted to tell you a bit about how this all happened. So Amelia and Emily, can you tell us kind of how our triad became our triad? Yes. So I was outside and my mom came down. We were actually skating on the rink. And my mom came down and said, Amelia, you have a phone call. So I went and I got the phone from my mom. And, she, and all I heard was, Amelia, is that you? 
And then I was like, hi, Emily. And she was like, hi, Amelia. And then she's like, so I was wondering if you wanted to be in our um, in our group for the rule of life. And I was like, sure, that'd be awesome. And then she's like, but we have a problem. We need one more person. And then I was, and then we like stood there for like five minutes thinking of another person to add to our group. And then I was like, who do we hang out at church with? And then I was like, Aaron, we hang out with Aaron after every church service. And so then Emily after, we'll explain this part. Um, well, after we got off the call, I called Erin and asked her if she wanted to be part of our group, and she said yes. And a while later, she contacted us and told us that we would be doing a Zoom meeting for it. And then we all logged on, and we eventually did that, I think, every week since. And it's been pretty awesome, and it was so awesome that you guys asked me to join and so that we can all do it together. It's been a lot of fun. So what type of things let's tell them what we do during our little triad meeting so what do we do while we're together um well we mostly read scriptures and talk about any questions we have about the scriptures um yeah and then before the meeting we kind of catch up on each other like at the very beginning say i get on or emily gets on before one each other we kind of talk about what we've been doing that week or any recent events or what's going to happen that week or something that we're very excited for or something. And then at the end of the meeting, sometimes we'll just, we'll pray and then we'll talk a little bit as after the meeting as well. And then we'll say our goodbyes and then log off. Yeah. And it's always so encouraging to be able to chat with, chat with each other and to read scripture together and to like, find connections between different passages that we've been going through. And we were even talking a little bit about that today. Um, we were looking at one of the passages about the, the seeds and the sower and how that is related to what, Amelia, you were saying? The man who built his house on the rocks and the man who built his house on the sand. Yeah, so finding kind of connections between all the different uh, Bible passages that we've been able to read over this, this time together. So what other things do we do during, during the weeks? So outside of the time we get to spend together, what are some of the things that we're asked to do as part of this rule of life? Well, for part of the rule of life, we pray three times a day. Um, one in the morning, one about like lunchtime or in the middle of the day, and one at night, like, um, and I remember, in, Emily, you were saying one time you have some kind of things that help you to remember to pray. Do you remember yeah. what those are? I keep a letter from each of you that was given to me through the mail. I keep it with my Bible. So when I see my Bible, I remember to pray. Uh, by keeping letters from you, I remember about our group. And then I remember to pray. Which is awesome. And I even have to remind me to read some of the scripture passages. I write them down on little sticky notes and I stick them on my Bible so that I have them. And those, those uh, help to remind me to do my readings as well. Yeah, I just set my Bible near my bedside table. And then if I just kind of pass it off as well, then I, I usually go into my closet uh, for, uh, in the morning and bedtime. And so I always see my box of letters from you guys and my other pen pals. And then I'm like, pray, pray, pray. And then I just stick it in there. That's awesome. Exactly. So we have our different ways of reminding ourselves that to pray and to, to be in conversation with God and to pray for each other too. So what things do you like about our time together about like the whole rule of life thing that we've been doing? What have you enjoyed? This isn't rule of life, but I also like socializing and I like reading the parts of the Bible because it is hard for like kids at our age to just go sit down and read the Bible because like sometimes we'll like to see like that colored print or that those pictures. But then we also need to remember that we need to read and 
make our own pictures in our own head. And we also need to remember what God has planned for us and what we need to focus on in our future. Exactly. No, that's excellent. What do you what do you enjoy about this, Emily? Um, I definitely enjoy, like Amelia said, the socializing with others that we haven't seen in a while. And um, I also like um, the opportunity to um, talk to each other about the questions we have while we read the verses. And um, that we um, pray and then we talk about um, anything that we have questions about, about anything. Yeah, which is, it's yeah. always nice to have a group of people that you can ask questions to about what you've been reading. Mm -hmm. And one of the other cool things about this is that we're not the only ones doing it, right? So there's like a bunch of other people who are reading and praying the same, they're reading the same passages as we are at the same time or during the same week. So it's, it's really cool to see that we're part of something even bigger, right? We're part of the family of God. And so we, and we're even doing these readings together at the same time. So that's always really neat to, to have happen. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to tell the church family about our experience with this? Uh, well, it's encouraged me to do other things. Like I've started a devotional a few days ago. That's wonderful. That's really awesome. So getting yeah. into the word. Yeah. Sorry. I'm yeah, here. it's um, helped me read the Bible a little bit more. It's helped me like connect, like self-connect, world connect, or Bible, other Bible stories to the Bible story we're reading right now. And um, like it's helped me understand a little bit more, especially since we all have different translations. So it's helping me because we all have different translations. So it's helping me um, figure out like how, what uh, words mean, but they're the same word. So yeah, and um, it's also helped me like figure out where the person's at in which part of the Bible, even if we do have different translations. So it's, it's been a way that we've been able to understand more and because of the variety of translations, we're able to understand what these words mean. So we wanted to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing, and we also encourage you to pick up your Bible and read through it as well, because uh, it's always something new when, when you open it up. So thank you guys for, for talking about what we've been doing, and bye, church family. Bye. Bye. Good morning, everybody. Pastor Holly here. What's up? Sam, aren't you going to say hi to everybody? I did. Sup, guys. Sam, that's not how you normally greet everybody. Whoa there, Mama. What you talking about? Sam? Sup, girlfriend? Don't you want to say hi to the boys and girls? I did. Sup. Why are you talking like that? Because I'm cool. You're cool, are you? Cool sock. All right, first of Chill all. Chill out, dude. Sam. Okay, first of all, I ain't your mama. And second of all, it seems like you got a little bit of two going on here today. You're not acting like yourself. I am. It's the new me. The new you? What yeah. was wrong with the old you? I like this one better. I'm not sure how I feel about that. Take a chill pill, will ya? Sam! Excuse me, but I don't think that I appreciate you talking to me like that very much. It's not very respectful. Shh. Sam. What? Seriously, what's gotten into you? I'm cool. And you're not being cool. <laughs> Sam, who gave you this idea that this is what being cool is? Tony. Tony Tube Sock. Tony the Tube Sock? Yeah. Oh, you've made a new friend, have you? Yeah, he's cool. And I want to be just like him. 
Well, Sam. You can be cool like me, Holly. I'd like Tony to so. Well, if being cool means to having an attitude and being disrespectful. I'll have no attitude. Sam. You have an attitude. <laughs> I think right there is an example of you having an attitude. You know what, Sam? I need to tell you a little bit of a story. Well, don't be long-winded. I've gone all day. Sam. You, you just need to listen. All right. When I was in school, there was a show on TV about kids my age that were in school. And I was generally a good girl. I did what my parents asked me to do and tried to do what was right. But there was a girl on this TV show and her name was Stephanie. And I wanted to be just like Stephanie. She was so cool. She would go to school and she would be dressed all nice and modestly and leave her home with her parents thinking that's how she was going to school. And then she would go to school and she'd sneak into the bathroom and she would change her clothes and she'd put on all this makeup and turn herself into something else to try and be popular at school. And for a while I wanted to be just like Stephanie because she was so cool. But the thing that I learned after a while is that she wasn't really that cool. She had a bad attitude and it cost her some friendships with some good friends that she had. And most of all, I just don't think she was living the way that Jesus would want her to live. And so it helped me to realize that there was other people around that I wanted to be a lot more like. And as I looked around, I'd go to camp in the summer and there was camp counselors that were just a little bit older than me who would come and they'd give their summers up and they were so talented. They would sing and teach us about Jesus. And then it started to be like, wow, they really love Jesus. I want to be just like them. And there was people that I looked around in my church and in my family, my parents, my grandparents, my aunt, and other family. And people, I have a friend named Bert. He's 99 years old now. And- Your chicken's name is Bert. Our chicken's name is Bert, yep. But uh, this was not a chicken. Bert was my Sunday school teacher in high school, and we knew that Bert loved us. He prayed for us. When Bert prayed, it was like Jesus was standing in the room. You could hear just the passion in his voice as he talked to Jesus. And I want to be like Bert in how he prays and how close he is to Jesus. I remember going to visit my grandparents. They only live five minutes away, but it was a special treat in the summer to go and spend a week with them. And every morning my parents had devotions and they would stop whatever they were doing and grandma or grandpa would read the Bible and then they would actually get down on their knees at their chair or at the couch in the kitchen and they would pray together. And I remember thinking, wow, that's a devotion to spending time with Jesus. And so those are the kind of people that I think are really cool and that help us to be more like Jesus and are good examples of how we can live for him. Not people who are unkind or disrespectful or have bad attitudes or maybe influence us to do things that aren't really pleasing to Jesus. And you know what, Sam? Good friends don't try and turn us into something that we're not, and you're not acting like yourself at all. I'm sorry, Holly. Oh, Sam, it's okay, and it's good to make friends, but, and we need to share other Jesus with others too, but it's important to be ourselves and to look up to people that... It didn't feel right. No, it, it didn't. It was hurting my voice. Yeah, it just wasn't like you at all. And when we try to be something that we're not meant to be, that's not, not good either, right? Because God made each one of us special. I'm going to tell Tony Tube Sock to stuff it. Well, you don't need to tell Tony's Tube Sock to stuff it, but maybe 
you don't spend as much time with Tony the Tube Sock. I'm going to invite him to church, to watch church on the YouTube. That's a great idea. Maybe he can learn to be like you and me and good people and Christians. Yeah, exactly. And we can share Jesus with others, right? And maybe he'll meet some other people too that he can look up to. Other socks too. Other socks too that love Jesus. And we can look up to them and follow them because as we do that... Maybe and he can be as nice as Sally Sweat Sock. Oh, yeah. That's... You know, introduce them to some good socks that'll be good influences. Yeah. Or Walter Work Sock. Walter Work Sock? Yeah, it's good ethic. Yeah, exactly, right? And I just want to say a little something to the grown-ups out there, Sam. Grown-ups, we have some kids and young people that are looking for people to look up to and to follow their example. And so I really encourage you to um, be looking to be a good example for the kids and the young people in your lives as well because it can make a huge difference in somebody's life. And we're not perfect and we make mistakes, but generally there's people out there who love Jesus and are growing in their faith and we can pattern ourselves after them. You know what, Holly? What's that, Sam? I love Jesus, yes I do. I love Jesus, how about you? I love Jesus, yes I do. I love Jesus, how about you? I love Jesus, yes I do. I love Jesus, how about you? Everybody really loud. I love Jesus, yes I do. I love Jesus, how about you? <laughs> oh, Sam, you're back. I am so glad. Back in the wall, Holly, back in the awesome. wall. Awesome. All right, well, boys and girls, find somebody that you admire. Maybe ask them why they follow Jesus and how they grow in their faith. And those are the kind of people that are really cool and worth looking up to. All right, well, hope everybody has a good day. Bye, guys. See you. Bye, everybody. <laughs>
we sing in Graves into Gardens. So, today's sermon is a pretty strong message from the Apostle Paul. His call is to imitate me. That's how he says it. Imitate me. It's an important invitation. I think we need to understand his offer. I think we need to see the humility behind it and gear up for putting our own selves out there to be imitated for the sake of Christ. Uh, let's look at our scripture passage today. We're in the book of Philippians, in chapter 3. Now we're going to finish off chapter 3 today. Philippians chapter 3. I'm hoping that you have a Bible with you. Uh, I, I invite you to have a Bible with you week by week. Uh, read along that way. Uh, use your Bible, be familiar with your Bible, and uh, a good way is following along in it uh, during sermons. So Philippians chapter 3, I'm going to start at verse 17 and go to verse 21. And here's what the Apostle Paul says. He says, brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many, of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, they walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly and their glory, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior 
the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Uh, Let's pray. Lord God, we want to imitate the Apostle Paul as he invites us to, but it's not because our eyes are affixed upon a person, upon a human person. Rather, they are fixed upon Jesus Christ. He's inviting us to follow him, not in every single way that he lives, but follow him in his first and primary loyalty. Follow him in his priorities. Follow him in setting Christ first in his life, in his mind, and in his heart. Help us to understand this, Lord, and then let us be people of faith worthy of being followed and imitated by others too. Amen. So this is pretty intense. Imitate me. Wow, how much confidence do you have to have in order to tell others, imitate me? I mean, we have imitations set up in lots of different ways in our world, don't we? Teachers teach students what they know, uh, essentially saying, imitate me in my knowledge. Mechanics teach their apprentice, basically saying, imitate me in how I do the job. Lifeguards teach kids how to swim, essentially, imitate me in the wisdom of water safety. Uh, People pay good money to take lessons from a golf pro. Essentially, imitate me in these movements to improve your golf game. Imitate me is practiced lots of different ways in our world. But here it's a bit different. We're walking in the world of morality and ethics here. Scripture affirms that God is holy and his people ought to be holy. And regardless of how detailed or accurate your definition of holiness is, we can all pretty much agree that it's a rather high standard. So if the scripture says to be holy, then who among us has the audacity to make the offer, hey, this holiness business, yeah, I've got it cased, so you can imitate me in holiness. I was once in a conversation with a guy. He said, he said I don't like to tell people that I'm a Christian. I said, why, why not? I mean, we're not supposed to be ashamed of our faith. Are you ashamed of your faith? He said, no, no, I'm not ashamed of my faith. I just know that I'm not very good at it. And I feel like if I advertise that I'm a Christian, then people will watch me more closely and I won't live up to that kind of scrutiny. In my experience, that reflects the basic approach of Canadian Christians. Uh, Far more humble and unassuming. Far less bold to say anything like the Apostle Paul, imitate me. We hesitate to put ourselves out there as an example, lest we come across as putting ourselves on a pedestal. And we don't want to seem that way. So I want to unpack all this a little bit this morning. Who shall we imitate? And what shall we imitate about them? And then... Are you worth imitating? So if you read your Bible, you will find in there people who are worth imitating, some who are not worth imitating, and some who it depends which part of their story you're looking at. Uh, Let's take the man Abraham from the Old Testament. Um, Abraham had some Moments worth imitating and other moments that weren't really worth imitating. For instance, he threw his wife under the bus a little bit, didn't he? Remember this part of the story? Uh, There was a famine and they were escaping it uh, into Egypt. Far from their home country, entirely susceptible to mistreatment because they were so far away from home. And Abraham had this knowledge. He he knew that he was chosen by God to be the father of a great nation. And that 
that promise had to be fulfilled in his life. It had to be protected. And therefore, he had concluded that his own safety was paramount. And so Abraham lied to preserve his own safety. His wife was named Sarah, a beautiful woman whom Abraham loved. But he told the Pharaoh of Egypt, he didn't say, this is my wife. How did he introduce her? This is my sister. Not wife, but sister, he said. Why? Why would he lie like that? Well, he lied because uh, kings in ancient days were powerful men. They had a reputation of taking what they wanted. Pharaoh, once he saw Sarah, Abraham was convinced Pharaoh would want her. But if he knew Abraham was her husband, then Pharaoh might have him done away with, thus freeing up Sarah for the taking. Abraham had to protect God's promise. And thinking quickly on his feet, he decided that lying was the best way to protect God's promise over his life. Think about that. Abraham was willing to toss his wife to Pharaoh of Egypt in order to preserve his own safety. A Bible figure of the Old Testament, uh, and that part is not worth imitating. But the same man, Abraham, he was also the man when God was pronouncing judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, Two cities that were known for their vile and despicable moral depravity before a holy God, Abraham pleaded, God, I know your heart. God, I know your ways. I know that you have mercy. Therefore, God, have mercy on these people. That intimate knowledge and, and understanding the heart of God, trusting God, relying on God's mercy, that part of Abraham's character, yes, we should imitate. Uh, the Apostle Peter, New Testament. The Apostle Peter, uh, he followed Jesus with vigor and passion, didn't he? His default was to trust and obey. And so when Jesus said, hey, Peter, step out of the boat and walk towards me, what did Peter do? Just that. He stepped out of the boat, walking on water with Christ at least for a few steps. Well, let's imitate that. Let's imitate his, his willingness to trust Christ. Well, we also know in Peter's story, uh, he made mistakes. When Jesus was put to trial, it was Peter who denied him uh, one time. Wait, it wasn't one time. It was two times. No, it wasn't two times. Three times, right? Peter denied Jesus three times. Well, let's not imitate that part. The honesty of the Bible teaches us something here. There is no person you can choose who is worth imitating 100%. There is no absolute moral purity in any human person. Only Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has sinless perfection. That's why he can forgive sins. Everyone else, even champions of the faith, are a mere dim reflection of his greatness. Abraham, the father of God's people, made the immoral decision to lie about his wife. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, denied him when the pressure was on. Even the Apostle Paul, who says these words imitate me, even that very same Apostle Paul, what did he say in verse 12 of Philippians chapter 3 here? What's he say in verse 12? He says, not that I have already attained this, and not that I am already perfect. He's not perfect. He understands that about himself, but it does not make him shy away from asking the Philippian church to imitate me. And not only himself. Look at the rest of verse 17. Brothers and sisters, join in, imitate me, in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. He's talking about multiple people here. Who are the, who are the these ones? And who are the us 
certainly he's talking about other people he's already mentioned in the, in the letter to the Philippian church, right? He mentions by name Epaphroditus. He mentions by name Timothy. Certainly he's saying imitate these young men as well. But he also talks about the, the church as saints and brothers and sisters in Christ as partners in the gospel. In other words, just look around you, Philippian church. You will find examples of worthy people to imitate right there in your own midst, in your own fellowship, in your own congregation, in your own church family. The Apostle Paul is well aware that the people in the church are not perfect. I'm in a room right now with only a handful of people and you know, just looking at the six of them, I know they're not perfect. <laughs> what? But they're looking at me uh, thinking the exact same thing, right? We're not perfect. Yet there is something about the Christians around us that is worth imitating. What is it? Is it a certain skill? My friend Dave is here this morning. He's really good on the soundboard. Is that what the Apostle Paul argues that we ought to imitate about Dave? Well, you know what? Not everybody's good at technology. So it can't be that. Uh, my friend Jim is here this morning. He's really good at managing people. That's a skill necessary in church life and leadership. Should we all imitate that about him? Well, you know what? Some people are are more doers than organizers. So it's not a skill for everyone. The Apostle Paul cannot mean that. My friend Betty is a wonderfully accommodating servant behind the scenes. And while there's a strong argument to be made that every Christian person ought to be so gracious, the gift of helps is only one of several spiritual gifts that people might have. So it's not any one skill. It's not any one particular spiritual gift. What is it that the likes of Dave and Jim and Betty have that is worth imitating? That Epaphroditus and Timothy had. That the Apostle Paul had. That all those who are not perfect, what is still Im worth imitating about them? Well, let's explore that a bit. What is worth imitating? Well, let's go again back to the Apostle Paul's words. But first, as the Apostle Paul does so often, he dives into the topic of what should not be imitated first. He, he goes into this. What we read in verses 18 and 19 is a scathing rebuke. But again, it's not against the Christians in the Philippian church, not even the ones who are critical against him personally. The, the target of his words here are, are false teachers, the ones he has already mentioned earlier in the same chapter, he calls them dogs. He calls them evildoers. Here he calls them the enemies of the cross of Christ. Look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 18 and 19. He says, for many, and these are the people he's calling out, for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, they walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Man, this is no small criticism. Their God is their belly. Their end is destruction. They glory in their shame. This sounds like it's the worst of humanity under scrutiny by Paul here. They are vivid words that conjure up images in our minds. Their God is their belly. What kind of image, what kind of person's image conjures up for you with those words? Their God is their belly. For me, it's, it's, it's a caricature, kind of a caricature in, of an old medieval king. A crown, royal robe, sitting at a table that could fit many, but is the only one there. The table is dressed with pheasant and suckling pig and pineapple and grapes while his servants can hardly scrape together enough flour to make a loaf of bread. His God is his belly. That's the image that comes to mind. 
Their end is destruction. I think here of a hardened criminal finally caught, wearing a prisoner uniform, hands and feet shackled together with a short chain, convicted of all kinds of atrocities. His face remains expressionless. His heart is unrepentant, and his eyes are a deep cold. He has caused destruction, and his end will be destruction. Apostle Paul also says they glory in their shame. I think here of the myriad of celebrities who with the current tools of Twitter and YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and every other social media outlet, they expose their vanity to the world with many behaviors directly contrary to Scripture. They flaunt their behavior for all to see. And instead of shame, they receive accolades the ticket sales of thousands and the cheers of millions. Their God is their belly, their end is destruction, their glory is their shame. We can imagine lots of different examples of that pretty quickly. But here's the thing. The Apostle Paul wasn't talking about generalized vanity in the world. He was not talking about the most extreme examples of indulgence in our society. His warning is for the Philippian congregation. His warning is for the church. The warning is for those within the church who would get distracted by all of these things. For every person, there are subtle enticements to draw your attention and affections away from Christ. And the fourth warning here is the biggest. In verse 19, their end is destruction, one. Their God is their belly, two. They glory in their shame, three. And then what's the fourth thing? They set their minds on earthly things. Minds set on earthly things. It's fascinating that we do this with our focus. If you ever want a sobering reality check, Look up some videos or, or pictures about the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. My goodness, the universe is incomprehensibly large, and there is no end to it that humanity can see. The edge of the universe is only a theoretical thing, a guess in the dark by our top researches, researchers, and, and we serve a God who made it all. And not only did he make this vast playground, but he made us to go in it. And yet this God decided to pay attention to us, to love us, to send his son into the world for us, to die for us, to offer forgiveness of sin if we confess them to him. And he will offer us eternal life, which is even more incomprehensible to me than the vastness of space. Eternal life. And what is that going to be like? And what do we do with all this astounding truth? We set our minds on earthly things. How small does that sound? Yes, there is something to be imitated in the Christian person. The Apostle Paul says it in verse 20. Look at how he transitions from here's what not to imitate to here's what we should imitate. In the Apostle Paul, in the likes of Epaphroditus and Timothy and others in the church. Verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. Yes, of course, we are here on earth. Yes, we have relationships and yes, we have responsibilities. Yes, God expects us to live fruitful and productive lives. This is no invitation to put your head in the clouds and pretend that you are super spiritual. Of course, we live in the physical world, physical bodies. And this is about priorities and loyalty. It's about values. It's about ethics. What does it mean to be a citizen of heaven? 
Paul spells it out. Well, we await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We understand that his life is part of world history. We understand that he rose from the dead. We understand that he ascended to heaven, yet left the Holy Spirit as a counselor for us. We understand that he will one day again return. He will eradicate sin in that moment, and he will make all things new. We trust in his promises. We trust that he hears and answers prayer. And we trust, verse 21, that he will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. The Christian person, folks, knows all of these things to be true. The Christian person trusts these promises made. And folks, these are things we ought to imitate about the Apostle Paul. And then there's a challenge to us. The challenge to us this morning is simply this. Is your life oriented such that your mind is not set on earthly things? but rather you know beyond doubt that your citizenship is in heaven, where Christ Jesus is our Savior and our hope. Because if that is true, then your faith is indeed worth imitating. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn in closing, and we're going to have Betty play that on the piano for us. The words will be on screen, and then we will... Have our benediction to close our service today.
Let's pray. Our Father, we need to have your confidence. We need, we need the confidence of knowing the Holy Spirit is in our lives and, and guiding us. And uh, we need the capacity to even follow him uh, properly and faithfully. But what a humbling thing that the Apostle Paul says, imitate me. Lord, help us to be a people who would follow well, who would follow his example, who would follow the example of others who are uh, men and women of faith, who would choose those ones to follow versus so many other examples in our world. And that, Lord, ultimately, you would build us into a people who could be imitated by others. Amen. Let's close with this scripture. The last two verses from Philippians chapter 3. Our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Thank you for joining in this morning and being part of our worship experience. May the Lord bless you richly this week. Amen. See you next Sunday.